Now let me uh, call our second guest of the morning. We'll have the presence of uh, Professor Joan Rockström from Sweden. He's the vice chair of the scientific advisory board of the Postdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. He's also chair of the Hertz System Visioning Task Team of uh, International Council for Science and will be talking about planetary boundaries. Dear friends, the Planeteers World Gathering occurs at a very important moment. The year 2020 is the super year. It's a super year not only because it's the five years of accounting for all world nations after signing the Paris Climate Agreement. It's also five years into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the roadmap, the Agenda 2030 for world development and lifting all people out of poverty and having good economic growth in the world. But it's also a year of reckoning. All science shows that this is the year when we have to start bending the curves, not only on reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, but also in stabilizing the natural ecosystems on Earth. It is simply the year of grand transformation. It's the year when we have to become planeteers, planetary stewards, navigating our spaceship Earth, in the words of Kenneth Boulding, within its finite and stable boundaries because we have reached a completely new juncture. We are today forced to pose the question, are we at risk of destabilizing the whole Earth system? We know the planet, our home, our only home, can exist in three different states. One state is in deep ice age, the state that we've been oscillating in, in long 100,000 year periods, which is like minus four degrees Celsius colder than the average temperature on Earth that we've had in the pre-industrial era. It's a period when we have two kilometers of ice above our heads in the northern parts of the hemisphere. It is the snowball Earth. The other extreme is the hothouse Earth. When we don't have any ice caps, we have a plus four, five, six degrees Celsius warming world. The tropical planet, the last time we were there was like 10 million years ago. Think of it as the dinosaur Earth, the hothouse planet that cannot support human beings as far as we know. Then you have this middle state, this equilibrium state that we call an interglacial state, the state that we've been privileged to be in since we left the last ice age 12,000 years ago. These interglacials that I call the Garden of Eden is the period that the planet has been oscillating in a kind of a limit cycle over the past 1.2 million years, some six to eight times. In fact, we know today from the latest climate modeling at my own institute, the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, that over the past three million years, the entire so-called Pleistocene geological epoch, the planet has been oscillating between ice age and warm periods within a very narrow limit cycle from the coldest state, minus four degrees Celsius, deep ice age, to a maximum of up to plus two degrees Celsius above our pre-industrial average temperature on Earth of roughly 14 degrees Celsius. Can you imagine? Three million years, huge natural variability with forcings from volcanoes and earthquakes and solar forcing changing over the millennia. And still the planet has been regulating itself within this narrow limit cycle of minus four, deep ice age, and plus two, minus four, plus two, almost like an harmonious symphony for three million years. We are now in the blink of geological time, putting this all at risk and just shooting ourselves right to the ceiling of the maximum temperature we've ever experienced since the last ice age at 1.1 degrees Celsius warming so far and following a path that will take us to above 3 degrees Celsius in just 80 years time. 80 years, it is the time when your children, my children have adult kids. That is a blink of time into the future. Now, in a recent publication, we show that it's not only the pressures on Earth through the Anthropocene and the Great Acceleration that is causing these risks. It is also that we know that the planet is an interconnected, self-regulating, complex system where all the biophysical systems interact. So we depend on stable ice sheets, rainforests, grasslands, temperate forests, coral reefs, Antarctica, Arctic, land glaciers, to be functioning in order to be stable because they provide us with feedbacks that can dampen and cool if we cause warming and forcing. 
Now, we published quite recently a paper showing that nine of the 15 so-called tipping elements that not only regulates the state of the Earth system, but also have multiple stable states, like the Amazon rainforest that can tip over and irreversibly move in a savanna state, or that the Greenland ice sheet irreversibly moves into a state where we can no longer stop its melting. Not that it would melt overnight, but that it would become irreversible. Nine of the 15 node tipping elements are showing signs of moving towards a very dangerous point. They're not crossing the tipping points yet, but they're moving in the wrong direction. We are therefore, what we scientifically conclude, in a state of planetary emergency. A planetary emergency is not a doomsday signal. It's not to scare or make people depressed. It is to unleash new ideas and innovation and investments into solutions that we perhaps previously thought were not possible because when you're stuck in a lulled into a comfort zone of incrementality, you cannot see that yes, in an emergency point, you need to put all hands on deck. You need to consider seriously in the next few years to get a global price on carbon, to get a global fund that can invest in carbon capture and storage at large scale, to put an end date on the combustion engine to 2030, say that every nation in the world must have a climate law. Why not agree, as a handful of countries have done, to be at net zero emissions by 2045, to be absolutely certain that we keep the resilience and the carbon sinks in natural ecosystems intact. This is what a planetary emergency can engage and create in an emergence of innovation and action. To guide this whole journey, we, I believe, as planeteers, must have science-based targets that can allow us to stay within the safe operating space of a stable and resilient Earth system that remains in a Holocene-type equilibrium. The Planetary Boundary Framework provides that guidance. These are the nine systems and processes that we scientifically today know with a very high degree of certainty regulates the state of the Earth system. It's not only a stable climate, it is also keeping the living biosphere intact water, land, biodiversity, and the cycles of nitrogen and phosphorus and water. But it's also assuring that air pollution and aerosol loading and chemicals are handled in a way that they don't threaten the composition of our genetic fabric in species from humans to predators in ecosystems. It is about keeping all the systems functioning. We can today quantify these in a relatively high degree of resolution and therefore translating them into operational implementation schemes for businesses, cities, communities, households in the world. In fact, we've come to a point today that scientifically we have been inspired by the Moore's Law. You remember the Moore's Law that became a self-fulfilling prophecy of innovation in the computer industry of doubling the speed every 24 months. In science, or for climate, we have a similar law, what we call the Carbon Law. That if you look carefully at the IPCC curves, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change curves, to be able to keep ourselves within a Holocene safe space of well below 2, aiming for 1.5 degrees Celsius on average warming, we need to cut emissions by half every decade. That's the carbon law. If we, at every scale, as an individual, as a community, as a business, as a country, as a world, can cut emissions by half every decade, we stand a chance of stabilizing the temperature at 1.5 degrees Celsius, which, at least from the scientific knowledge we have today, would enable us to avoid crossing tipping points of irreversibilities towards a hothouse Earth trajectory. This is a guide inspiring us to innovate and scale novel, renewable, decarbonized, sustainable solutions in food, in construction, in transport, across all sectors in society. It's quite exciting to see in the Exponential Roadmap project that we've been presenting at a number of heads of state and business meetings to show that in most sectors in the world, from agriculture to construction, we have the solutions. It's a question of unleashing the opportunity of scaling through the right policy incentives and having the actors with us from science, policy, community and business. So this is a moment of truth and a moment of raising the ambition but also the implementation of new ideas. And therefore, I would close just by saying that scientifically, 
in all these risk analysis, the window is, as far as we know, still open for a manageable future that can provide us with a prosperous and equitable future for humanity within planetary boundaries. I think the planeteers meeting and the world gathering that you are setting out for now is an incredibly important moment to keep up that momentum. So good luck in your deliberations and looking forward to be planeteers together in the decade to come. Thank you very much.